If Jesus had been just one more person piling another set of demands and requirements and moral, um, moral rules on top of us, he would never have had the impact he had. What is at stake ultimately is two things. Um, what is real and what is good. What Jesus said about life and why it makes sense to doubt or believe on this day of discovery. Today, visitors to Israel's Golan Heights have come here to see how life was lived 2,000 years ago. Constructed of volcanic rock, this is a restoration of an ancient Jewish village called Katsrin. The central structure was the synagogue, surrounded by closely connected buildings. Without modern conveniences, life in this community was lived much as others had lived for thousands of years. It was in these primitive and challenging times, including the Roman occupation of the first century, that a teacher by the name of Jesus said that he had come to give life a whole new meaning. This is a restoration of an ancient Jewish home here in the Galilee, and we're in the kitchen. Take a look around. It's a reminder of how different life and times are today compared to the past. Here you have your oven. I've been looking for the refrigerator, and I don't even find running water. These pots are a reminder of how difficult life could be in the past, even to get something as simple as, as water. You know, the Bible tells a story about a woman who took a pot, maybe something like this, and went to get water. And at the well, in the middle of the day, she met a man, a man named Jesus. As the Bible describes the conversation, it first says that Jesus asked the woman for a drink. Later, he says to the woman, but if you had asked me for a drink, I would have given you living water and you never would have thirsted again. Now think about what Jesus said. That's the kind of statement that has caused people over the centuries to doubt him and to, to raise all kinds of questions of what kind of a person is this that would make such an outrageous promise to this woman. What could Jesus have meant when he talked about a living water that would satisfy a person's thirst forever? His offer must have been as hard to believe then as it is now. But the questions are important. To this day, life itself as common and as complex as it is, causes the wisest among us to ask some of the most basic of questions. What is at stake ultimately is two things. Um, what is real and what is good? Those are the two basic questions. And the reality question, again, is not a sophisticated metaphysical thing. It's the question, what can I count on? Or what will I run into if I'm wrong? So what was Jesus saying about life? What did he mean when he said so many things that sounded too good to be true? What was he claiming to offer when he said, I am the bread of life? He who comes to me shall never hunger. Or, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. On another occasion, he said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. And on another occasion, I am the resurrection and the life and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. How do we even begin to weigh promises like this that include a life that begins now and lasts forever? What if we feel it, it's beyond our ability to know? And after all, Jesus lived a long time ago. At the very minimum, what Jesus said and claimed needs to be tested. It needs to be tested along with all of the other options for finding our way in this life to see what is real and what is good. What 
will I run into if I'm wrong? That's not a bad definition of reality. It's what you run into when you're wrong. And uh, what is real, uh, what I can count on in my life, uh, determines then what is good. Because what is good or desirable, the thing I should pursue, there are different ways of putting the same question, depends upon what is real. If there is a God, or if there is no God, uh, if the world is purely physical and I'm just my brain, uh, that makes a huge difference in relationship to the question of when am I well off and when am I not well off. If I'm just my brain, perhaps some version of uh, sensual gratification and success might be my good. If I am uh, a spiritual being with an eternal destiny, that changes the question deeply. Now, all the great thinkers from Plato on have understood those two questions, what is real and what is good, are tied together. They can't be answered separately. I love Socrates, but Jesus asked better questions than Socrates did. And I love Plato, but Jesus gave better answers than Plato did. And he gave better answers to the very questions that both Socrates and Plato were asking. And he didn't just give these answers in words, he gave them in a three-dimensional life. What is truth is a really difficult question, and it's going to be answered in sentences that can be either true or false. But it also has to be lived out in a life worth living. And Jesus did both things. He both spoke in places like his famous sermon that he gave on a mountaintop, where he talked about what it meant to be really happy, what it meant to really change oneself and change the world for the better, for justice, for love. He also lived out that life. He was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to love his enemies. He was willing to turn the other cheek. He was willing to be strong when everybody else ran away. So there are lots of philosophers out there, many of whom are much, much smarter than I am, but there aren't a lot of philosophers out there, I can't think of any, smarter than Jesus. Jesus was, I think, the smartest man who ever lived. But what separates Jesus from all the other smart people who ever lived was that he fully lived out everything he said. He was committed to his own beliefs to the point of death, and it didn't end there, it ended in life. But what does it mean to say that the death of Jesus ends in life? And if it's a claim that requires us to believe in miracles, how do we even begin to weigh such claims? The difference is, in his case, he fulfilled his promise in rising from the dead. Christians believe, and there's a lot of evidence that he did. It's no secret that followers of Christ believe that, according to the biblical record, there are compelling and converging lines of evidence for a resurrection that gives credibility to what Jesus said about life. But what if what if someone isn't ready to accept the Bible as fact? Even then, biblical scholars, whether they believe in God or not, tend to recognize at least four facts related to Jesus' resurrection. First, Jesus was crucified by Roman authorities. Second, the disciples had experiences that they believed involved appearances of the risen Jesus and all of them but one actually died as martyrs for believing that they had seen Jesus alive after his death. Third, Paul the Apostle started out as a skeptic and as a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. And then suddenly he converted, believing that he had seen Jesus alive. And fourth, James, Jesus' half-brother, changed his mind about Jesus from one of unbelief to worshiping his brother as the Messiah of Israel. Another significant factor for the miracle that would give meaning to what Jesus said about life is the evidence of a tomb that witnesses say they found empty after three days and the fact that the body of Jesus has never been found. But if we accept this as evidence that the resurrection is true, what then does that tell us about what Jesus said about life? 
Most religions say you work your way up to salvation or you earn it or you do something where you fix yourself. Christianity is unique and Jesus' message was unique in saying the only way to get fixed is to come through him. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus predicted that it was through death that he would offer life to all who believe in him. When you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Gospel of John also tells the story of a woman, a woman with a troubled past, who ended up believing what Jesus said to her about life. According to this account, Jesus met her near the modern Palestinian town of Nablus, in the biblical region of Samaria, at Jacob's Well, a well dug by one of the founding fathers of Judaism. In many ways, this woman might have seemed like an unlikely follower. She was a member of a Samaritan community that had issues with their Jewish neighbors. In addition, she had been married five times and was now living with a man who was not her husband. Jesus broke tradition by asking this woman for a drink of water. And then he directed the conversation, making a curious offer, an offer that sounded too good to be true. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He makes an effort to touch those whom many have rejected because they're perceived to be sinners or evil, and he tries to get them to basically reconsider and, and re-encounter God, if I can say it that way. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. See, most religion, and this is true of the modern world as well, says we can fix ourselves. But what Jesus says that's unique is the only way to get fixed is to let God fix you and to let God do it his way. And that you need something you cannot give yourself. You need to ask God for something only he can give you, and you need to have the humility to be able to do that. The water is clear. You see the rocks so plainly. And yet when you, you look up to the horizon, the foggy conditions have made it difficult to see the difference between where the water ends and the, the sky begins. This is the region of the Sea of Galilee that according to the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples knew so well. It's also the region in which Jesus made promises promises of a, a gift of life, of everlasting life, that down through the years have raised all kinds of questions and doubts, not only among his followers, but among those who, who haven't believed in him. And the men and women that we're, we're hearing from today have given a better part of their lives to, to weighing some of those issues, of thinking about what the gift of life was that Jesus promised, and the kinds of questions that so many have asked about that. Now, if you ask why it is that the disciples drew, drew around Jesus, I think it is because they sensed that there was something very true about what Jesus was saying about their need. A person who responds to Christ has, comes to a sense of appreciation that what God offers as a gift is something that they cannot generate for themselves. And that Jesus does things that a human being cannot do. Someone has, has said this, that uh, as a matter of fact, I, I believe it was uh, kind of coming out of Aristotle, but echoed by C.S. Lewis, that uh, if you live your life against the grain of creation, you're bound to get a splinter. Or as another contemporary philosopher says, reality is what you bump into when you do something wrong. And therefore, that uh, grain of, of creation or that which you bump into when you do something wrong, well, that's just the way the world is. That's, that's that natural law. Uh, and it's... Um, really puts you in, in jeopardy when you aren't aware of what it is 
and you don't align your life in accordance with it. Matter of fact, foolishness is perhaps best, uh, best defined as living in a way contrary to that natural law. Wisdom is de best defined in living in harmony with it. If the view that Jesus had about the world, which I'm going to call the Christian worldview, is really true, um, then even people who deny it have to live in that world. So if they deny this view, there is going to be a contradiction in their life between the way they view the world and the way the, the world actually is. Francis Schaeffer called the, this the point of tension, that is the, the impact point between the wrong beliefs and the way the world really is. Another person put it, reality is what wounds you <laughs> when you don't take it seriously, okay? Same concept here. So, great example from my own life. Growing up in the 50s and then in the 60s in the counterculture movement in the university, I was a strong moral relativist, okay? That's a view that there is no right or wrong, objectively. Uh, people have opinions, but it's just their view. And so people can have opposing views. It's like flavors of ice cream, okay? It's just like that. Uh, yet at the same time that I was promoting moral relativism, I was marching against the war in Vietnam. Why was I marching against the war? Because I thought the war was evil. Wait a minute. How can how can it be the case that there are no morals that are objective, yet the war was objectively evil? Well, the answer is, it can't be the case. That's a contradiction. That was my point of, a, a point of tension. When you look and compare Christianity with other worldviews, you see Christianity makes sense because it speaks, it gives, it makes rational sense when it talks about the realities of life suffering, evil, sin, death, life, salvation. Compare these ideas with other worldviews and look and see if there's indeed an intellectual uh, basis for the Christian faith. Though Jesus never traveled far from home and never wrote a book, people around the world continue to believe what he said about life and to accept the gift of life that he offers. I got an email not long ago from somebody who said, you know, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, but I admire Jesus, you know. He called him the wandering Near Eastern sage. <laughs> he said, I have great respect for the wandering Near Eastern sage, and I respect what you do. And, um, and I wrote back and I said, you know, if Jesus was just a wandering Near Eastern sage who gave us more ethical rules, then he would never have had the impact he had. We've had plenty of sages telling us how to live. We've had plenty of holy men giving us more rules, more rituals, more demands, um, telling us how to live the good life. We've had plenty of that. The impact of Jesus' teaching and reported resurrection did in fact change the world. The Roman Empire abandoned the worship of its many gods and many claimed Jesus as the only Son of God. The calendar changed, marking a new age where Jesus' promise of life gave hope for peace now and forever. But why did Jesus have such a lasting impact? We, we all know what we need to do to be good. If Jesus had been just one more person piling another set of demands and requirements and moral, um, moral rules on top of us, he would never have had the impact he had. The reason Jesus had the impact he had is that he said moral rules are not the way to get saved. Moral rules are not the solution to our lives. The solution to our lives is that Jesus, as you know, God himself came down, became human being, and suffered the punishment that was due to us because we break these moral rules all the time. In other words, Jesus was saying, I've done something to reconcile you to God. In one of the most well-known verses of the Bible, Jesus explained his mission on behalf of God. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And only in Christianity does God actually come down. Everywhere else you are reaching up. That goes back to desperately seeking and um, something and thinking that you can do it yourself. 
for some reason, a lot of people want to try to do it themselves, but only in Christianity does God reach down for us, which is enormous. And he didn't just reach down, he came down in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, every religion basically says there's, um, there's some kind of a problem. There's a gap between us and the divine. Um, there's, uh, we need to be enlightened. There's, there's some problem that we face, and they all give you a set of rules on how to, how to fix it, right? You know, you need to do this kind of meditation. You need to have this special diet. You need to follow these rules. You need to do these rituals. You need to do, you need to do, you need to do. They're all telling you what you need to do. They're all piling responsibilities, um, new tasks on top of you. Christianity is the only religion that tells you what God has done to cross the gap, to repair the relationship, to fix the problem. It's the only religion where God took on himself the task of coming and fixing it for us so that we don't have to be the ones who, who you know, solve the problem. It's not up to us. It's not anything we do. It's what God has done. That's what's unique about Christianity. And that's what's unique about Jesus. If he were just one more wandering sage, why, believe, why pay any attention? We all kind of know the golden rule. And we all know we don't keep it. We all know we all have our, our sense of inadequacy and guilt, inferiority, failure, and so on. We know we don't do what we, we should do. We've got plenty of people telling us that. We don't need that. What was unique about Christianity is it was not one more set of rules. It was a solution. It was, it was a, it's not up to what you do. It's what God has done for you. One of the surprises I think people will find when they read Jesus through is that there really turns out to be only a modest emphasis on the poor or even on loving one another. They're in there. They're important, but they're not a central feature. Jesus didn't say, I came to help the poor. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, to give my life a ransom for many, to call sinners to repentance. Now, when sinners properly repent, they do care for the poor as part of the ethic, but it wasn't the reason he came. Most people, if they hear about Jesus, know anything about the church, they know Jesus died for our sins. But that's actually half the message. The other half of the message is he came to give life. Uh, he came to give life abundantly. And that life is in part an empowerment that comes through the gift that Jesus gives of fellowship with him in which God provides an enablement that we don't have without him. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to make possible the kind of life that he was offering. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, theologically, we talk about this in terms of the gift of the Holy Spirit, and most people go, Holy Spirit, what in the world would that be? But let me put it in different terms. He's talking about an enablement that God gives, that comes from God, that enables the creature to reconnect to the Creator. And through His Spirit, He enables and empowers that uh, possibility as, as happening. This comes on top of what most people associate with Jesus, which is His death for sin. So is what Jesus said about the gift of life just too good to be true. Well, the, the story of the, the people of this land says that there will always be some who will find reason to doubt. There'll be others who, who say that they found reason to trust him. Some will say it's, it's just a matter of faith, but others like those we've heard from today will say, yes, it's, it's a matter of faith. But they believe that there's plenty of reason for all of us to give careful consideration to the promise that Jesus made. So if life matters, and if what Jesus said about life is true, then the decision is now ours to accept or reject a life that is real and good, a life that can make a difference for us now and forever.